Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research. I'm your host, Henry Smith. Today our guest is pa Pastor Gabriel Fleurer, and he's here today to talk about his book, Alive, How the Resurrection of Christ Changes Everything. Gabe, welcome to Digging for Truth. Thanks for being on the show with us. Thanks so much for having me today, Henry. It's a joy to be here. All right. Well, um, uh, you, this is your first time coming on our program, so I was hoping that uh, besides the fact that you and I had a class together at Westminster when, <laughs> when you were a Ph.D. student and I was in the master's program, we, we crossed paths there. Um, tell the audience, just a, 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 give us a quick summary, summary of your ministry, if you would, please. Sure. Um, let's see, I uh, became a Christian after I graduated from the University of South Carolina in 2002. I uh, started studying at Reformed Theological Seminary in Charlotte shortly uh, thereafter in about late 2003, and then went to finish at Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. I uh, got my MDiv there, and during that time, I was the youth minister at uh, Second Presbyterian Church in Greenville, South Carolina, and then from there went to Westminster, where we crossed paths. And after I went to Westminster, I was a church planter for the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. And from there went to First Pres Jackson, Mississippi as uh, the Minister of Discipleship. And then took a similar call to First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina. I was in both those calls for about four, four years each. And then now have been here almost a year at First Presbyterian Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Fantastic. That's quite, a, that's quite a journey. I always love it when I see people who go through the academic realm, but then become pastors to the people of God. You know, as R.C. Sproul said, take it to the pew. Amen. And, Amen. and uh, I, really, I really love that. I think it's great. Okay, so we're here today to talk about your book. We're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord today. And what a great topic to talk about, obviously, the resurrection of Christ. So my first question I wanted to ask you, uh, Gabe, was, you know, at the beginning on page four, you, you say this. This is, really, this is really good, and I'd like you to flesh this out a little for the audience. The resurrection is a historical reality with theological meaning and incomprehensible from the worldview with which it is connected. If, in other words, if it's disconnected from this worldview. Could you explain what you mean by all that? Yeah, what I was trying to get at there... Um however uh, imprecisely I stated it, was uh, that when you look at the resurrection, the temptation usually is to begin with the facts and the evidence, both of which, as I go on to argue, um, and I try to argue well, are very important, that I think the facts and the evidence overwhelmingly show Jesus rose from the dead. But we have to enter the worldview of the Bible to understand what the resurrection is, and why it happened. So I, I would want to hesitate to start just from a bare consideration of the facts because facts are always interpreted through a worldview. And so when I was writing that portion of the book, I wanted to make clear that there's a, there's a worldview that underwrites uh, the reality of the resurrection. And I would argue it's the only worldview that makes the resurrection possible or anything at all possible. So I wanted to avoid starting just from the fact of the resurrection itself and, and get behind that, as it were, to the worldview that underwrites it. Yeah, that, that, I thought that was great to set the stage in your book that way. And I think uh, th this is great for the layman in the church to understand this principle. There is a temptation to sort of jump into the fact debate. And in some sense, that's understandable in terms of the resurrection, because we want people to accept the fact that it's true. And if the, the facts lead them there, then they may become a they may become a Christian, but there's so more, so much more to it. Now, the way you develop that thought, uh, the, that thinking in the book, um, is particularly having to do with fulfillment and uh, foreshadowing. Those are the two sort of mm -hmm. names of the two chapters that you get into. Let's start with the foreshadow part first and talk about that. Well, if you read the Old Testament, um, one of the things that stands out clearly, though, because of the progress of how God reveals himself, not in the same clarity we're going to find in the New Testament, of course, but what we see is that re the resurrection of Jesus was not something that was just out of the blue. It has a background. It has a story. It's connected to God's larger story of the redemption of his people. 
And the foreshadowing of the resurrection is very stark in the Old Testament. And you see it in places like the book of Daniel. Um, and then I think most strikingly, uh, how Jesus argues against the Sadducees in Matthew 22, when he talks about the fact that you can find the resurrection uh, taught in Exodus 3.14. Now, I think most of us reading Exodus 3.14 would say, I have no idea where the resurrection is in that passage, and yet Jesus rebukes the Sadducees for not seeing it there. Uh, so the foreshadowing part was really to set the stage that this, uh, the resurrection of Christ was not a de novo event. It was predicted. It was prophesied. Yeah. Uh, from the Psalms and the patriarchs to the prophets onwards. And therefore, it's, it's something that, again, connected to the worldview, we should have been looking for it. And that's why I think Jesus upbraids so many of the religious teachers for missing so much of his ministry, not least of which was his coming resurrection. Yeah, and, and the way you describe it in the book, too, is really good. It's not just mere proof texting. Proof texting. You know, we have a temp temptation to sometimes do that. You know, this text proves this and this text proves that. Mm -hmm. But it's the whole vision of redemption. Maybe comment on that a little bit more, if you would. It, well, I think if you go back to even the garden, uh, what was held out to Adam in the covenant of works was eschatological life. And not eschatological in the common sense of the term of that we usually understand it as having strictly to do with the end times. But eschatological in the sense, uh, as one author put it, of ultimate things that had Adam obeyed and uh, kept the covenant of works, he would have gone on to higher life. Uh, with God and would have enjoyed eternal life with him, and so would have all his posterity. But as Paul makes clear in Romans 5, 12 through 21, that's not what happened. And we know from the sad story of the fall, that's not what happened at all. So the second and last Adam, as Paul calls him, Christ, is the one who fulfills the covenant of works and brings that eschatological life to us most completely at the general resurrection at the end of all times for, for believers. But even now, uh, for believers, that we enjoy the inner man being renewed. We are already seated with Christ in the heavenly places, as Paul tells us, because of the resurrection of Jesus. So that eschatological component, I think, is what's so dominant in the Old Testament scriptures when it comes to the this event in particular and the coming new creation. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. And, and that is the contour of the book. And I want to recommend, again, the book to our our uh, audience alive, how the resurrection of Christ changes everything, because uh, Dr. Flora spells this out, not only the facts of the resurrection, but the way the story points to God's redemption of his people. And we're grateful that you've joined us for Digging for Truth today. I'm Henry Smith, and we'll be right back after this message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus by discussing Gabe Fleurer's book, Alive, uh, talking about here on Easter Sunday. And now, uh, Gabe, we, we left off uh, sort of laying out a little bit in your, in your book about the story of redemption. Um, but one of the things in, in the apologetic discourse is actually the facts of the resurrection, too. You ask a question in one of your chapters, you name it, you know, fool's errand, question mark. Is this, is this a fool's errand? Uh, uh, of course, you and I would argue no, right? But l let's talk about a little bit about ultimately explaining the empty tomb, because that's really what we need to get at. Yeah, and, and what I try to do in that chapter is just walk through some of the various theories that have been proposed to deal with the empty tomb, because I, I think it's even a fringe movement in skeptical circles today to deny that you know, Jesus didn't live. So, or, or things like that. So the people acknowledge, generally speaking, that Jesus was a historical person and that we have this 
uh, early, very early emergence of this resurrection story. Now, um, story not in the sense that it's a fable, but that this is what the narration of what happened. And then there's various theories put forth to explain away rather than explain the evidence. And so what I wanted to try to get at there was to highlight the assumptions used by a lot of unbelieving historians to undercut the resurrection and show how those assumptions were wanting. Yeah, so, so one of the, the theories which, you know, in these days we kind of consider ridiculous now, but it still has life to it, and that is the swoon theory. Maybe you could explain the, the swoon theory. You discuss that a little bit in, in your book. It's been developed in a lot of other places, but yes. nonetheless, nonetheless, we have to tackle that. Yeah, we do. Uh, and the swoon theory, in essence, states that Jesus really didn't die on the cross, that uh, he somehow survived the crucifixion, and again, I'm painting a very rough sketch here, but was revived in the cool of the tomb, was able to get out of the tomb um, through various means, and then was uh, able to convince his disciples that he was alive and the Lord of glory that was promised in the Old Testament. Now, I think we can get an answer to that in two directions. First, you can't explain the New Testament itself um, when you take that theory, because the New Testament itself, like the rest of the Bible, one of the things that sets it apart from the so-called other sacred books is its unhesitating uh, ability and uh, really eagerness to record the faults of the heroes of both the Old and the New Testament. So, for example, Peter was scared by a servant girl just prior to Jesus's resurrection. Yes. Then all of a sudden he stands up in front of the very people who put Jesus to death and preaches a sermon like we find in Acts 2. Uh, unless Jesus was alive, that's really hard to explain. And let's be clear here, too, about the, the swoon theory. I mean, we, what's amazing about the New Testament as well as it records the crucifixion of Christ is that it's very sparse in its details. And all throughout the Middle Ages, we had passion plays. We still see that impulse today with movies that whenever they deal with the crucifixion of Jesus, invariably spend a lot of time on the blood and the gore of it. Now, to be sure, the original audience didn't need an explanation. They had seen a lot of crucifixions. That was one of Rome's chief deterrents for crime. But the New Testament is very sparse on when it talks about it. So we need to fill in some of the details there. And one of the things that becomes very clear is that flogging, we're told Jesus was flogged, usually took the life of the victim before they were crucified. And then when someone was actually crucified, when someone is crucified, they die not usually by bleeding out. That was the whole point of it. It was to prolong death. And so they die by asphyxiation, not to be too graphic, but it is a horrifying way to die. Yes. And Rome employed it to, again, be a deterrent to say, if you mess with us, this is what will happen to you. So to make the swoon theory plausible, you'd have to have a pretty bad misconception of what actually happened during the floggings and the crucifixions yes. in first century Rome. Yeah, and not to mention, you mentioned this in your book too, about the rolling away of the stone and yes. the, yeah. imp the impossibilities of, of all of that. Well, I'd, I'd like to stay there with, uh, you know, talking about some of those, you know, evidential details, but what I'd like to move to in this, in this segment here um, is one of the things you emphasize is sort of the authentic feel of the narrative as, as it unfolds in the four Gospels related to the resurrection. It is, has such an authentic eyewitness detail. Even something like you mentioned, uh, go tell the disciples, Jesus says, and Peter. Yeah, yes. a beaut this beautiful. Go, expand yes. on that if you would, please. Well, that's one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. I, I, a lot of scholars argue that uh, Peter was probably um, in the background there uh, for Mark's gospel, that it was from Peter's account, and therefore that um, Peter was the one telling in the eyewitness details. So that, that little detail there and Peter uh, makes so much sense when we understand the background of the gospel of Mark. But when you read through the rest of the gospels, they don't read as myths and legends like we know them. Uh, we, they don't read like things that we would pick up in um, a book of fables. There is that ring of truth to it, uh, to put it roughly. So that's one of the things I think that's highlighted by those two little words and Peter. So that, that's what I was trying to get at in that section and for the rest of that. 
Yeah, it's very good. I was wondering, you, you made connections to Adam, and on, on our program we have tried to emphasize the necessity of a historical Adam, the way that the Bible presents it. Uh, Jesus as a gardener, you have about a minute and a half mm -hmm. to comment on that. I thought that was beautiful, the way you drew that out. Oh, thank you, brother. Well, again, we look at the progress of redemptive history from Genesis to Revelation, and gardens play such a large role. I mean, Adam was placed in the garden, but the garden was a sacred space. Uh, it was a real place. It wasn't, you know, mythologized in any way by it being a garden. Uh, and that imagery is not to suggest that somehow it was just made up by the biblical authors for a good story. But gardens play a prominent role. So as you walk through, you see the original Adam was placed in a garden. Uh, Jesus tells Peter to put his sword away in a garden, which is just amazing. And then when he is raised from the dead, he appears to a woman, first of all, which again, as I point out there, it would have been unheard of to, to establish a new religion. And then second, he appears as a gardener, which is just pregnant with biblical imagery. And that's not surprising because John's gospel contains so many of those kind of biblical images. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, and it just occurred to me, I never thought of this before as we're discussing it, that, you know, the, the woman focus we've always, we always talk about in terms of eyewitness, but, you know, Eve was the one who was deceived. And how, yes. appro how appropriate it is that Jesus as the gardener appears to a woman. What a redemptive picture for her as well. Yes. And I think one other thing to add, just real quick, I know we had the break here, but the garden, the, at the end in Revelation, um, at the end of, of the Bible, in Revelation 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth appear as a garden and a yeah. city and a temple all put together. That's, that's excellent. Well, friends, thank, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We appreciate your being here today as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. And we're looking at the book Alive by Gabe Floor. And we'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm Henry Smith. I'm here today with Gabe Florer. We're talking about his book, Alive, How the Resurrection of Christ Changes Everything. And indeed it does, Gabe. We've been uh, talking about the evidence, talking about the, his connections to the Old Testament. Let's talk about another essential element of the Christian worldview, and that is the world to come. Mm. Yes, and, and the resurrection, of course, speaks to that. And I think the best place to go is 1 Corinthians 15, where, again, Paul uses language full of biblical imagery when he tells us that Christ's resurrection is the first fruits of our resurrection. And he's pulling on the uh, feastal calendar of Israel there uh, to, to describe the resurrection of Christ and our coming resurrection, so that the hope that Paul finds throughout his ministry, and this is just all throughout his letters, is the hope of resurrection, the hope of a new heavens and a new earth, the hope of a body that is like Jesus's resurrection body. And that hope, Paul says, is living from the future into the present. And it's not therefore a conjectural or an empty hope. It's a hope that, uh, if we could put it graphically, has legs. <laughs> resurrection legs. And it's a hope that will not disappoint, as he tells us in the book of Romans. Yeah, you know, I, I was reminded when I was reading your book one time, I, I had a work colleague who said, we were talking about what happens when you die. And he said, you go in a box. That's what happens. Mm. Mm. And I thought, my goodness, how, how first of all, wrongheaded that is. And secondly, how do you know that for sure? Are you willing to stake eternity on that? It, it was an interesting dialogue. It didn't go very far, but you know, <laughs> a lot of people say that. Oh, yeah, I've heard it from loved ones. I've heard it from friends. And I'll never forget, uh, when I was there at Philadelphia, I did some uh, coursework in philosophy at Temple University. And I had the privilege of studying under one of the world's uh, great continental philosophy scholars. And we were reading Martin Heidegger, who was um, a very famous philosopher in the 20th century. 
Uh, he's come under a lot of fire for his connections with Nazism, rightly so. But uh, Heidegger had this whole idea that man is a being unto death. And I'll never forget sitting on the 17th floor of this building at Temple University, seeing the sunset over Philadelphia. And just that morning, I'd been studying the resurrection with Dr. Richard Gaffin at Westminster and feeling hope surge up within me as I heard this professor expound so eloquently on how we were just going to die and go in a box. That was uh, that was uh, the essence of uh, Heidegger's teaching in that case. So we we have a sure hope as Christians, and that's yes. something that this world is desperate for. And when you get down to it, with so much of apologetics and evangelism, yes, there are intellectual uh, objections that need to be and have been and can be answered. But so much of it is just what you described with your colleague. It's just people come to these conclusions and hold on to them through their whole lives yeah. and never really look at the other side, never really look at the evidence. That was my story for sure. Now, speaking of that, that's the perfect segue. It's as if you had crafted the program instead of me. <laughs> what I want, what I wanted, the, the thing I want to talk about here as we, we come down in the last few minutes of the show, Gabe, is, the, is your introduction where you talk about how the, the, the arguments for the resurrection influenced your conversion and that talking about conversion is legitimate. And uh, I want you to add the, the Bart Ehrman um, thing in there with that, if you would, that little anecdote, because I thought it was great. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, I, the way the Lord brought me to himself was through a, a, a series of very interesting things, which um, I don't want to bore your audience with. But one of the things that he used was a book uh, by Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ, which would argue from a kind of different apologetic perspective than I might take, but it's still just a wonderful book. And he, it was the first book that really opened my eyes to the other side of the argument, because I was raised in a uh, anomaly Christian home, but had wonderful parents, wonderful siblings, wonderful home life. And my dad had been a college professor. So a lot of books around. I started reading philosophy when I was very young, and my dad would talk with me through it. So I'd been doing a philosophy uh, undergrad at South Carolina and really felt that hopelessness and really saw uh, one of my favorite philosophers uh, came to be Nietzsche because uh, I believe that Nietzsche really, um, really underscores the hopelessness of the anti-Christian worldview and, and really had the courage of conviction to live it out. So many of uh, the philosophers didn't. And that's why I think I respect to this day reading his writings. And so when I saw the other side of it, it was the first time I'd encountered an intellectual argument that I realized now and at the time it was very prideful of me to not consider the other side. But then I realized that there was a lot of people walking around like I was that had never been exposed to that. And right. so when God began to work there, he then brought R.C. Sproul's uh, program, Renewing Your Mind, into my life, and everything kind of fell into place. And um, I was born again. I know it. Uh, I can tell you the difference before and after. I, I know what. God did in my life, and he used that book and that radio program and various other people and events, and uh, it was just the most amazing thing that's ever happened and in my life, and uh, that's why I wanted to open up talking about it. And to Bart Ehrman real quickly, he uh, read a lot of his stuff. His books are New York Times bestsellers. Um, he is a guy who has done a lot of damage to the faith, I think, but he opens his books with his deconversion testimony from a uh, you know, a very naive uh, student entering uh, Moody Bible College, and he was this fundamentalist, and then he was enlightened when studying at Princeton. And I thought if he can do that, and he's a well-respected academic, and I'm certainly nowhere near the caliber of a mind that he is, but it still made sense to me to tell my story at the beginning of this book that was an apologetic book, while his are anti-apologetic books. <laughs> yeah, that, that's very good. And I, th I thought that brought home uh, the personal testimony is an apologetic in and of itself, and um, and it's it's okay for us to share that. And we do have the intellectual arguments on our side as well. Well, Gabe, I want yes. to thank thank you for taking the time to join us, and thank you for this excellent book. Um, I just really enjoyed it. Um, I think it's great for church laymen. They uh, those who have friends that are objecting to the faith could buy it and hand it to them and say, please consider these arguments. So really, thank you for the hard work, and 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 thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for your kind and gracious words, brother, and thank you for having me on today. Well, I'm grateful, too, for all those years ago that we crossed paths at Westminster. And, As am uh, I. Uh, continue to do the great work in your ministry. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, Henry. God bless you.
And friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth today, where today we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. This you can be sure of, not only by the revelation of God given to us in the New Testament, completed from the old, but also by external evidences that validate and vindicate the proclamation of the gospel. We pray that you will turn to Jesus, the one who overcame death, for the forgiveness of sins and for the gift of eternal life. And we thank you for joining us today for Digging for Truth.